Chapter 13, La Cloche Rock. When Pierre was only eight, his grandfather back in France has, had died. Since he had never met the man, he hadn't understood his mother's tears. Though mother told him her father was a wise man, tall and noble, a professor at the Sorbonne. To Pierre, he remained a faceless shadow. With Lalande, it was the opposite situation. Lalande had been all too real. Awake or asleep, it made no difference. Pierre could see Lalande's face grinning above the gunwale as he lifted the canoe free, not knowing that only an instant later he would be dead. Without thinking, Pierre would listen for Lalande singing. Then, every time he looked up and saw that Lalande was gone, the horror of the French River flashed back into his mind. Their second night on Huron, Emile was sitting next to Pierre at the campfire. Pierre finally felt like talking about Lalande. He asked his friend, Do you ever wonder if there's justice? Both boys were staring at Jean Beloit, who was off by himself and being unusually silent. It's hard to say, Emile said, pausing to pull off his cap and run his fingers through his tangled hair. Maybe what seems unfair for now will even out in the end? In other words, Pierre said, if we're patient, one day certain disgusting idiots will get what they deserve, and then... Charbonneau overheard the boys and interrupted. Pierre braced himself for a lecture. The steersman would tell them to toughen up and get on with their lives. Instead, his voice was soft, rather than soldierly. There's nothing harder to accept than a good man dying young. Calling it fate or the will of God or bad luck doesn't help either. He paused with his steely eyes, reflecting bits of embers from the fire. Every one of us is just as angry as you young fellows, but the years have a way of numbing a man. We'll all see it happen so many times that a part of us has died with every mate that went down. We care, but we can't let the sadness touch us too deep. A good man is gone, but if we lose our edge, the lake will be burying us all. When Charbonneau walked off, Pierre stared after him with new respect. There was clearly more to this man than the tough face he showed to the world. The north shore of Lake Huron was 200 miles of spectacular canoeing, with no portages to slow them down, and with a string of islands to protect them from onshore winds, the brigade man great, made great time. The days were clear and warm, and Pierre paddled without his shirt or cap. When he went bareheaded, the old-timers teased him about being out of uniform, but after the chilly days on Ottawa, Pierre enjoyed the feel of the sun. Like his father, he tanned quickly, and like his sisters, his hair bleached to an almost white blonde. The muscles in his arms and shoulders began to stand out as a result of his thousands of paddle strokes. But with Lalande gone from his place in the bow, the beauty of the days was empty for Pierre. On the third consecutive day of clear skies, Pierre was surprised when Charbonneau started complaining. I don't like the look of this. It's all wrong. This isn't what Huron's supposed to be in June. Don't be such a doomsayer, Emile declared with a grin. We'll pay for this later, Charbonneau insisted. We'll be begging this weather back. I tell you, it's not normal. Enjoy it while you can, Beloit chided him. Charbonneau waved a hand at the islands. I've seen good weather wasted on Huron before. We can take anything here. It's on Superior but one in help. That lake is 200 fathoms in places that's so and so cold she makes a climbing all her own. It might be summer up on those hills, but here on the water, a squall can bring it down to freezing in minutes. The crew bullied their steersmen into silence with a chorus of boos, but his comments made Pierre nervous. Father called Superior the big lake, and he often spoke of its wild spring storms. Pierre also knew that Lalande's death weighed heavily on everyone. Voyagers liked to pretend they would never die, but the bowman's tragic, tragic end served notice to everyone. For Charbonneau's crew, Lalande, Lalande's absence was even harder. Their newly appointed bowman was Beloit. While Lalande had urged the men on with his songs and positive encouragement, Beloit was like a snarling dog. Paddle, ladies! He'd yell at the crew. You pull like a bunch of old hags. Is it time for the rocking chairs? He saved his best insults for Pierre, calling him whatever came to mind. Puppy, whelp, snail, baby. It made no difference that his strokes were get getting quick and clean. 
Pierre knew it was selfish, but when the name-calling was at its worst, he almost felt angry at Lalande for di dying and leaving him with Beloit. Though he dreaded taking on full days of paddling, Pierre discovered that the open water was small work compared to the Ottawa. The portages and the miles of upstream paddling and toughening both his body and his mind. He could paddle for hours at a time now, free for the effort of thought. How many strokes so far today, Pierre? Charbonneau teased him. How many strokes? Pierre echoed, remembering his former clumsy self. Those first few days on the trip, he'd shared his counting with no one. Who says I count strokes? You did, but you don't, right? Charbonneau laughed. It was that way with all us all. At first, you had count every paddle stroke and mark every mile. Then, soon you're too tired to do anything but forget. The work comes easier, and most important of all, he chuckled, the rest of us stay dry. Pierre was surprised at Charbonneau's gentle humor, and he was proud that the steersman had noticed the improvement in his paddling. The weather stayed perfect as they worked their way along here on shore. To the north, bare quartz-flexed hills rose up from the water's edge. To the south, beyond the offshore islands, Huron stretched off in open blue. One day, while they were navigating through a strait barely wide enough for the canoes, they passed a magical boulder called La Cloche. In anticipation of the event, Beloit had scavenged a rock during their last pipe stop. Listen to the bell, schoolboy, Beloit said, turning and waving to Pierre as they approached the huge rock. Pierre wished they could maroon this fool on the boulder. He would die a slow death as he deserved, and the seagulls would peck out his dirty black eyes. The men shipped their paddles, and the canoe went into a silent glide. Beloit leaned over and wrapped the gigantic bals basalt boulder with the rock in his fist. A deep, mournful tolling issued from the very core of the stone, startling Pierre. It sounded like a bell within a bell. He'd never heard anything to match the depth of its tone. Every cruiseman, crewman listened in silence as the note echoed like a chord struck in an earth-locked cavern. Pierre was still enjoying the beauty of the moment when Beloit started his infernal cackling. Pretty music, ain't it? He crowed. I swear, it's as sweet as a church choir. Church choir? Charbonneau interrupted. Just what would you know about a church or a choir? Ha! Beloit laughed. That's a good one. Ha 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 ha. Pierre pulled again on his paddle, glad to work at forgetting evil men and nicknames and deaths that shouldn't be.